Hello, uh, my name is David Nichols, and I'm reading today from my new book, which is called Us. This is a scene from quite late in the book. The, the main character, Douglas, is, uh, is attempting to impress his son at the school quiz. And he's also attempting to impress his wife, Connie, who has uh, started a flirtation with uh, a neighbour called Mike. So, this is the school quiz. Albie went to sit with Ryan on the benches, and I cast around for a prospective team, settling on a shuffling band of lone parents loitering by the door as if about to bolt. Not the most prepossessing group of contestants, but never mind, I raised my hand to Albie and allowed myself to imagine the conversation in class the next day. Your dad was on fire last night. He carried that team. Your dad, he knows his stuff. I understand, perhaps more than anyone, that intelligence is not the quality a son most values in the father. Mike, as far as I could tell, was as stupid as a wall. But it could do no harm for Albie to see me win at something. And in a public forum, too. We were offered bottled beers and a selection of snacks and took our place at our trestle table. Few activities in life are more unpleasant to me than the task of deciding an amusing name for a quiz team. I have undergone surgical procedures that were less painful. Why couldn't we be red or blue or green team? After long deliberation, it was decided, for reasons I can't bring myself to recall, that we would be the cranium crushers and that I would be captain. Mike and Connie's team were called mobiles at the ready, which got a laugh but which made me anxious because that kind of anarchy is just intolerable to me. I pushed it out of my mind and thought about deepest lakes, longest rivers, highest peaks, a whistle of feedback, and we began. Of course, the quiz was a travesty of what I understand by general knowledge. The music questions were skewed heavily towards the current pop scene, the sports questions almost entirely towards football, the news and current affairs were trivial and tabloid in nature. There was nothing at all on science or geography, inventions or mental arithmetic. We did what we could, but Mike's team, the aforementioned mobiles at the ready, were a tight little huddle of whispers and giggles. Mike and Connie head to head at its center. Yes, they hissed to each other. Well done, write it down. It seemed that Mike was not as dim as I'd imagined, at least with regard to song lyrics and celebrity tattoos, and Connie's hand gripped his forearm tight. Yes, Mike, yes, you're brilliant. Elsewhere, other teams were cheating in a supposedly light-hearted way, you could hear the tap, tap, tap of tiny keyboards, phones bleeping in their pockets. And as the evening progressed, my indignation increased, magnified by the effect of the bottles of beer we were encouraged to buy in aid of the theatre fund. Our chances dwindled. I slumped in my stackable chair. And now, said the quiz master, our penultimate round, flags of the world. Finally, I sat up straight. While the other teams scratched their heads, I ticked them all off and showed both thumbs to Albie, who was distracted and didn't see me. Then, I couldn't quite believe it, name the rivers, name the lakes. I rallied our team, the correct answers accumulated, and it was time for marking. We swapped papers with Mike and Connie's team, and I watched as they laughed and jeered at our answers on pop music. In turn, I shook my head at their suggestions for flags. Venezuela? Oh, Mike, I'm sorry, no. I remained rigorously fair in our marking, but in general, the process was sloppy and ill-conceived. Was it one point for a bonus or two? Eventually, our team's papers were returned with a smug grin from Mike, and immediately I noticed several errors. Clearly, there had been some spiteful marking down, points lost for writing USSR instead of Russia, when in fact USSR was the more accurate answer. Too late, though, because our scores had been noted and now the results were being announced. Six, fifth, fourth, third. In second place, the cranium crushes. Mike and Connie's team had beaten us by two points. I watched Mike and Connie embrace to cheers and applause, and on the benches, too, Ryan and Albie were clenching their fists and whooping in that simian way. But I remained concerned. One point for each bonus question when we'd given them two. Nothing for the USSR. Mentally, I calculated our correct score, calculated it again. There was no denying we'd been cheated of victory, and I felt 
I had no choice but to cross to the quiz master and make the case for a recount. For a while, audience and contestants seemed confused. Or was the evening over? Not quite yet, not until I'd consulted with Albie's head of year, Mr O'Connell, pointing out the discrepancies in the marking. Mr O'Connell placed his hand over the microphone. Are you sure you want to do this? Yes, I think so. Yes. By now, the hall had taken on the grim and solemn air of a war crimes tribunal. I'd hoped my intervention would be taken in the light-hearted spirit I'd intended, but parents were shaking their heads and pulling on their coats, and still the recount continued until, after what seemed an age, justice prevailed, and it was announced to the half-empty hall that our cranium crushers had lived up to their name and won by half a point. I looked to my son. He did not cheer. He did not punch the air. He sat on the bench, gripping his hair with his hands while Ryan draped an arm around his shoulder. In silence, my fellow crushers divided up the spoils, 10 pounds worth of vouchers to spend at the local garden center, and we walked out to the school car park. Congratulations, Doug, said Mike, standing by his transit van with a grin. You showed us who's boss. Then to my son, with a hateful wink, your dad, he's practically a genius. In times of old, we'd have just gone at each other with clubs and rocks. Perhaps that would have been better. Anyway, the three of us drove home in silence. For as long as I'm alive, I never ever want to talk about this evening again, said Connie quietly as she unlocked the front door. And Albie, he went upstairs to his room without a word, contemplating, I suppose, just how very clever his father was. Good night, son. See you tomorrow. Standing at the bottom of the stairs, I watched him go and thought, not for the first or the last time, what an awful feeling it is to reach out for something and find your hand is grasping, grasping at the air. So thank you very much. Um, and I hope you can join me again on Thursday, the 6th of November at nine o'clock, where I'll be talking about the book once again for Mum's Net Book Club. <laughs>